Hello, Zero Books readers and viewers. This episode of the Zero Books interview podcast, Zero Squared, features a conversation between Sean Sayers and Steve Paxton about uh, a guy named G.A. Cohen and his analytic interpretation of Marx. Um, they debate whether or not Marx needs Hegel or if we need Hegel in order to understand Marx. Um, there's a conversation about the difference between forces of production and social relations. It's all very fascinating for the Marxist nerds out there. Uh, in the parent room, you'll be hearing a debrief with Steve Paxton. Steve Paxton and I discuss just how this conversation went, uh, how unfair I might have been to Steve during the conversation, and uh, some of the uh, unresolved issues from it. So, if you enjoy this with uh, this debate between Sean Sayers and Steve Paxton, tune into the Parrot Room, pay your five dollars a month, support us on Patreon. You'll get even more interesting, nerdy Marxist stuff. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Zero Squared is the Zero Books podcast. Uh, the reason the conversation came up with me and Doug is because I think um, some of the stuff that you were saying in your interview with Doug about Cohen, I think, is I think you've misread it basically. So, well, let's let's jump in. Let's let's do, let's do this. Um, so. So, Sean uh, Sayers is a, an emeritus professor of philosophy, uh, University of Kent. He has written extensively on Hegelian and Marxist philosophy from a Hegelian Marxist perspective. Last year in April, he appeared on the Zero Books channel in order to discuss his criticism of G.A. Cohen. And since then, Steve Paxton, who is the author of Unlearning Marx, a book that came out in January of this year from Zero Books, has made it known through Twitter that he he believes Sayers criticisms of Cohen has some flaws. So I, I, they were both nice enough to come on the channel and, and, and uh, duke it out or have a civilized discussion about their differences around Marxism. Um, to begin though, I should say GA Cohen was a Canadian political philosopher known for his work on Marxism. And particularly he's known as a proponent of what's called analytical Marxism. So to start, uh, maybe I can ask um, Sean first and then, uh, you, Steve, what do you think uh, analytical philosophy, I'm not analytical philosophy, analytical Marxism is? Um, and that's where we'll, we'll start. And then I'll give you a chance to voice your, your concerns about our previous conversation on the channel and, and Sean's critique of uh, G.A. Cohen, uh, Steve. But Sean, to start with, what is analytical Marxism? Analytical Marxism was a movement of uh, movement in Marxism and in philosophy, which uh, uh, flourished in the uh, 70s, I guess it was, yeah, 70s and 80s and 90s. It, it's pretty much past now, I think, in its, in its influence, but, but in its time, it was highly influential. And it was really the, it was the attempt to use the techniques of analytical philosophy, British analytical linguistic philosophy, uh, to interpret uh, Marx, 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 Marx and Marxism. And one of the main uh, proponents, well, really, I think the most important philosophically, anyway, the most philosophically important uh, work was, was Jerry Cohen's um, uh, Karl Marx's Theory of History, a defense, which came out, I think I'm right, is it 78? 1978. Yeah, about, uh, and he had a very you know that was a very influential and important book and what what it you know using the techniques of analytical philosophy to interpret marxism meant uh in jerry's uh, uh usage and in uh in general uh 
first of all, it's anti-dialectical. It's and it's uh, it's anti-Hegelian. Uh, that that was a characteristic of British analytical philosophy, and it's a characteristic of the way that uh, Cohen and other analytical Marxists uh, interpreted Marx. They tried to give an account of Marx which eliminated the dialectical uh, aspect of it. And what this meant, I think, was to either. I mean, Jerry uh, Cohen's book makes very sharp analytic distinctions between the various uh, terms uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, aspects of, of Marx's analysis, you know, between forces of production, relations of production, between base and superstructure, between, um, uh, for, for, yeah, I mean, the, 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 those terms of very nature and society, he makes a very sharp distinction between what's natural and what's social. And he tries to analyze Marx within this, and, and you know, to analyze these different terms quite separately and argue that they, you know, you can under, you must understand Marx in this very uh, analytical, separated, sort of atomized um, uh, theoretical framework. And it seems to me that the effect of that is is to, I mean, it's important to, and there's nothing wrong with analysis. On the contrary, analysis is an absolutely essential uh, aspect of, of, of our understanding of things. But one must recognize, and I think this is the great strength of Hegel and Marx to do so, one must recognize that you know, these things, you know, you can separate them and look at them in, in, in their separation, but they're in reality, in concrete reality, in the actual workings of society, these aspects interact. They 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 they're in relationship. For you can't you know for forces of production, the various uh, you know technology and uh, and uh, and uh, aspects of production always function within a social context. They can't you know you can't abstract them completely from that. I think that, anyway, that's my understanding of what analytical Marxism is and was, and what I would regard as, uh, you know, the sort of Hegelian criticism that I'd want to uh, uh, put to it. One other aspect, I guess, I don't know whether this will come up in our discussion, but it seems to me that another essential aspect uh, of analytical Marxism has been a, a moral approach to Marxism rather than a historical one. Cohen was very, you know, had a very strong view that uh, Marxism had, a, you know, relied upon a conception of justice, a theory of justice. He's an egalitarian. He became a very strongly egalitarian uh, philosopher. And he, he believed that Marx, Marx's critique of capitalism was essentially a moral critique of its, of its, class divisions of its inegalitarianism and his ideal of socialism was of a inegalitarian a classless uh, society I, I think that Marx's uh, picture of capitalism and his conception of socialism are far more historical than that I think he regards uh, capitalism the capitalism is is is, is a society which, according to Marx, is riven by conflicts and contradictions. And, it, and his point is not so much that it ought uh, to give way to a better form of society, but that it will do through, its, through the operation of the historical forces at work in capitalism. Capitalism will eventually come into crisis and be overthrown. And another society, uh, socialism, not, not as a better society, but it is the society that we, that of the future that will replace capitalism, and I think that that moral approach to um, to uh, Marxism has also been a feature of of, uh, of of analytical Marxism that I would question. So, Steve, rather than defining analytical Marxism, why don't you go ahead and, and voice your objections now? Uh, um. Okay, so I think, I mean, a lot of what Sean said I agree with, a lot of Sean's characterization of um, analytical Marxism and of Cohen's approach, I would agree with. He 
definitely does you know he wants to split up and very tightly define all the different elements of the, the theory that he's dealing with so he spends quite a bit of time just defining the economic structure and the production relations that compose it um, and he spends a lot of time talking about produ productive forces and what is a productive force and what isn't a productive force and going through quite a lot of quite kind of detailed stuff with a lot of reference to Marx and um, Marx is often quite vague and he sometimes contradicts himself and stuff and in, to some extent Cohen is kind of tidying that up seeing which which different definitions are consistent with each other um, and I, as Sean says that's that's a you know that's a necessary part we do have to do that um, but I think really my issue with Sean's understanding of Cohen is that Sean kind of implies that that's where Cohen stops that that he mm -hmm. Um, he defines all these things in separation, and what Sean's saying is th is that you need to to um, to recognise that they all that they interact with each other, and there, there's a unity there. Um, when in the uh, in the interview that Sean did um, on this channel last year, I think um, you Doug were asking what you know what what is tell me what what dialectics is. Um, and you kind of pushed Sean for a, for a off the cuff definition. And, and what what Sean said really was that it's the, the two main characteristics are that everything is related, and that things are always changing. So I, I, is that does that sound fair, Sean? Is that a kind of a yes, absolutely a, fair. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So so the, well, well, can I interject and say my yeah. thought is that that things are always interrelated, <clears throat> often enough through opposition, dialectically. Or yeah. that yeah. 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 Yes. Um yes, I mean and change. I mean, I guess the the thing one might add to that definition, I can't remember whether I said this at the you know in that previous interview, but change is based on the conflicts and contradictions within things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think um but but the thing is I, I think Cohen is is com he completely embraces that. There's that there's three main kind of um theoretical planks that he introduces in that book, Karl Marx's Theory of History. Um, one is the development thesis, which is entirely about how things change. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is the primacy thesis, which is about how the relations of production and productive forces interact to, to produce that change. And the third is uh, functional explanation, which is his kind of idea about how we understand how those how that interaction happens, because it's kind of it happens in a counterintuitive way and um he kind of uh, he sees it a little bit like the process of um natural selection by chance variation that things happen and those things that 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 kind of provide some kind of advantage in whatever the circumstance at the time maybe a military advantage or an economic advantage or or, or whatever those the, the the um the people that are able to adopt that new technology are able you know get gain some kind of an advantage over those that don't and um, others will copy that because it's good because it's a good thing and it's, it's giving people an advantage and all these you know the, the um, there's an almost infinite amount of different experiments in human relationships going on all the time and those that work and push things forward get adopted and, and kind of move on in a kind of an evolutionary way um, the whole evolution revolution thing is, a, is another, another bit of marks I think we could we might touch on later but it's not necessarily relevant to this particular part where, where I'm, I would argue that um, the thing that Sean says Cohen doesn't do, which is take account of the fact that everything is related and things are always changing, is actually, it's completely central to his whole approach. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, Sean, do you, do you yeah. want to respond? Go ahead. Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, I think you give a very good account of, of the, you know, the functional explanation uh, aspect of uh, Cohen's work, and you're quite right, I think, to re, you know to say what well, you know the, bring out the similarities with natural selection. I think my, but I mean, if we look at you know how he accounts for uh, 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 social historical change, let's have a look at look at that a bit. I mean, the primacy thesis. I, I mean, what that means, what and I, you know, is that pr the the material aspects of society are the primary. Uh, for uh, you know the primary basis of change in society again that's yeah. Marx's materialism yeah. that's right I mean what I think he, said, you know, he says they they determine the character of the relations to a greater extent 
than happens in the opposite direction. He doesn't. He doesn't say nothing happens in the opposite direction. Obviously, that you know the, the relations have to tr drive the forces forward. That's what capitalism. That's the difference between capitalism and feudalism, in a way, or one of the. Yeah, he, I mean, he he doesn't say that nothing happens in the opposite direction, but he's very scathing about. I mean, he talks about dialectics as as a sort of in, you know philosophy of, of of interaction where. You know, I, I can't remember his, his exact terms now, but he's rather scathing about the idea that there's a sort of interaction, really. He wants very much to say that, you know, movement comes from the bottom up. It's technical uh -huh. development which drives, which determines industrial development, which determines economic development, which determines social development, which determines ideological change. I mean, it's a very deterministic, uh, bottom up. Um, well, I think um, I, th I, th I think so. So the development thesis really kind of says that um, the productive forces tend to develop. Yeah, um, which is more than saying that they do develop. It's it's not just a collection of happy accidents or they have developed. It's there is a tendency there, uh, driven by the fact that humans are sufficiently ingenious to invent ways to make their lives easier, and sufficiently rational to use those things w when they've been invented. And to, and yeah. to you know to take that that tech, to use the technology that they're capable of inventing, and given that that is if if we accept that that is true that humans are you know and it's the historical record shows that it's it, that that at least it happens whether there's a tendency or not, um, if people are going to you know if the productive forces are going to develop, and then if you combine that with a really central tenet of Marxist theory of history, which is that certain um, levels of technological development correspond to certain types of, of social and economic arrangement mm. then uh, and also that they come into conflict so certain types of of, of um social arrangement will, will come into conflict with it with further development of the forces so if that's the case and rationality dictates that the forces the development won't be subverted indefinitely we might you know we might have for some uh, cultural or religious reason we might choose not to take up a, 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 a new technology when it arrives but eventually people are going to do that if we don't someone else will they'll gain a competitive advantage you know i'm kind of very much paraphrasing all of this but um if if it's the case that that um the productive forces and, and the i.e productive capacity tends to develop and that at some point uh, different social forms um, will provide a break on that development, then it will be the social forms that give way. It won't, we won't just stagnate. Development won't just stagnate forever. Eventually, the social form will give way and we'll move on to a to a new social form. And so that is so. so in that way, it's not so much that um, the development determines everything about a society, but it's that it has an explanatory primacy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I mean, we have to move on to yeah. new societies. It doesn't necessarily determine the character of those societies. I think that the, uh, I mean, I think one's got to question some of those ideas, or at least, I mean, moderate them. I mean, the idea that there's a sort of constant tendency for the productive forces to develop. Now, why does Cohen believe that? Well, it's not constant. It's not constant. It, it's a tendency that happens. So he, what his phrase is that it, it, he, when he says a tendency, he argues that that is both more and less than the statement that the forces have developed. So it's more than that because it's not a collection of happy accidents, but it's also less than that because it doesn't say that they might not stagnate for a bit. They might even regress. But eventually, mm. technology moves on. And now why, I mean, he says, now why does, what account does he give of why that happened, why that? Because, there is that tendency with, be, because they don't exist in a void, they exist within the context of, of production relations. Yeah, ra rational, rational to what? Rational to the satisfaction of human needs. And the assumption here, and I think he makes this explicit, doesn't he, is that human needs are constantly increasing. Um I, I'm not sure if he will, if he does actually. Um, well, he's make got that. to say he's got to say that, otherwise there there wouldn't be any pressure for uh, the productive forces. You know, our rationality wouldn't mean that uh, we would develop our productive forces. I mean, um, it all starts with a notion of hum of constant, you know, constantly increasing human needs. That's I'm not that, sure it does. That's, a, that's a, a universal, a historical, 
tendency of human nature, and I think this is um, correct. I mean, I, in in, no, in, I, in, I, in I can I can I can I ask yeah. a clarifying question of Steve here? Um, uh, in in my understanding of Marx's account of uh, the, the development of the productive forces, uh, what's central to his explanation for why there is an internal drive to increase production and increase the technology that uh, and and become more and more sophisticated um, uh, in the way that we produce things uh, and provide more and more commodities uh, for people in the world. All of it is driven by uh, the need to expand value, to expand the kind of value that is taken from the exploitation of workers, that this is the central kind of social or nearly ideological principle that sets up the terms of the social relationships that then are worked out materially and through production and that because of the way you know money operates as the embodiment of this labor value um, and the way it sets up exchanges and the competition between the capitalists all of that it tends to drive the expansion of capital and which uh, then also can mean, but not primarily mean, doesn't primarily mean, but it can mean that the human needs are met in a, you know, in newer, more sophisticated and expansive ways. But it doesn't always mean that. It could also just mean that capital expands. And but that, we're talking about pre-capital, pre-capitalist societies. No, right? I'm talking about under capitalism. I'm talking right. about okay. under capitalism. Um, I'm not talking about pre-capitalist societies at all. I'm saying uh, Marx's explanation for why you know, under capitalism, there tends to be more and more commodities produced yeah. and there tends to be an expansion of human needs is based on his labor theory of value. It isn't based on any innate principle about human beings. Well, I think, yeah, but I think that's a different question. I, th I think what you're talking about is something, you know, Marx often says that capitalism, capitalism is a kind of a unique system and, it, and it's and it, uh, lots of things happen that had never happened. It's not just bigger and different it's kind of fundamentally different. Lots of new things happen under capitalism that didn't happen before that. But I think what Sean's talking about is um, whether or not there's a kind of a innate human expan an innate expansion of human needs over time. And he's saying that that's an ahistorical approach. And I, and I would agree. I don't think there is a, a, a that. But I think what Cohen's talking about is not necessarily an expansion of human need, but it's an expansion of human you know want it's it's you know you somebody invents a washing machine i don't need a washing machine i could go down the river and, and wash my clothes there but i'm not going <laughs> to not have a washing machine you know for, for very long when there's one available and um and, and also there's there's you know there's competition in terms of scarce resources so if if you know in in feudal time somebody invents a new trebuchet or something that's a, they, they don't need that trebuchet, but but whoever's got the best arms or the best army or, or, or the best military power is going to find it a lot easier to get the other things that they do need, the amount of land and and resources that they that their society needs. So things you don't have to have a kind of a, 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 a philosophical concept of expanding human needs across time and space that, that isn't anything to do with circumstances. You can just accept that people will generally take any opportunity to make their lives easier and more secure and to make their society more secure. I, d I think there's a lot of uh, historical evidence that put, puts that in question. I mean, that's a feature of capitalist uh, human, the way humans behave under capitalism. They're constantly wanting more and more comfort and more, more, more and, and uh, easier life and goods. But I mean, the, the remarkable thing is that in pre-capitalist societies, there's very much less drive to produce more and more uh people i mean it, people had to be forced almost made educated indoctrinated to want to, uh, to get more and more there's plenty of evidence to show that workers uh you know pre-capitalist workers when factories were introduced were very happy to just work to satisfy the needs that they the traditional needs that they had and then they'd knock off um, yeah, yeah. He can't, you know, capitalism can't function like that. Yes, um, yes. you know, well, that, well, that's the they really. go and you know they take holidays on Mondays. They'd 
you know, it was called Saint Monday. Yes. They'd, they'd, they'd go off to the harvest, you know, and leave the factories to bring in the crops. I mean, capitalism... Okay, so, so, so why, why, though, did, um, you know, why, why somebody was making them, somebody was stopping them from taking Monday off, somebody invented yeah. the, the six-day yeah. week. Yeah. That, and it the wasn't just they had to be disciplined to want to work for more and more and more. The proposition isn't that every human being every day wakes up wanting more and more. The proposition is that as a society, when when people work out ways of doing things that make life easier, which they do, people don't say, "I'm not going to bother with that. I'm I'm going to I'm just going to do things the hard way." No, but I think Cohen, I mean, to come back to Cohen, I think, I mean, I think there is the assumption in Cohen that P, it is just human nature to want more and more and more. And then no, the I don't, well, I don't recognize that, but I, you know, that's, that might be. Human. Well, I, it, it sounds to me like w maybe we need to discuss, like, what is the difference between uh, what Steve is describing as a, just a kind of general uh, common sense notion that if people encounter, uh, technologies or practices or heck a new plant um that will make their lives easier or meet uh what they meet their needs more quickly or with less work mm -hmm. that they will take to that to, and and a philosophical notion i mean the that you know they're like a principle uh that the way that sean's describing it and i guess i i'm noticing that the evolutionary account of humanity is sort of, I think, uh, maybe the the foundation of this idea that human beings naturally try to find approaches to their life that make their lives easier and more comfortable. Because the idea is just that human beings will uh, work out ways that will maximize their chances for survival. Um, and and is that right? Is that what's underlying cohen here is a sort of evolutionary understanding of of history i think there's some something in that yeah and i, I think humans have a survival instinct as as most organisms do and and there is a kind of a society version of a survival instinct where where people and actually it's not just that you know if society doesn't have a survival instinct then it's pretty soon going to get it's going to be conquered or it's going to going to become a, an economic dependent of or a colony of some other country that does have that instinct so um there is a, there is a process at work there that drives technology on Sean. yeah and, and we can see that technology has been driven on you know we're we're we're, we're not writing on papyrus and you know we we have digital watches so it, that's all cool. yeah you know what I still do because I'm a hipster. I, I write on papyrus and I have an analog watch. <laughs> but um, Sean, but I mean, there's a tremendous difference between the way uh, you know, technology and industry has developed in a, you know, at a breakneck pace since the introduction of capitalism, and and the oh, very definitely. yes, yeah. And, well, I don't think Cohen has any account of that because he, you know, as I say, I think underlying his view is a is a sort of constant the a thesis of a sort of constancy of human human humans always want the the, the best the the most uh, uh, advanced sort of technology I, I don't think Sean, I, I, I want to ask Sean something real quick here Sean what do you think that Marx viewed society in the as in the sort of Darwinian way that or that viewed human nature through the lens of evolutionary biology um and did he was his critique uh, of capitalism based on uh, an idea that we could we could survive more easily in a, another system? Did he take these assumptions for granted? Was was he was he like Cohen thinking of society in this evolutionary way? No, I don't think he is. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say, really. I think yeah. that, you know there's a much more historically differentiated account that he gives of the way what drives societies on uh, or keeps them uh, stationary at different at, at different historical periods. I think what uh, the sort of evolutionary account uh, assumes is a sort of capitalist, you know, uh, war against, or, you know, sort of competitive war, uh, which is always going on, 
um, and which is under capitalism. You know, it's it's you know, compete or die. But I mean, that pre-capitalist is, societies were pretty hot on kind of conquest and domination, though, weren't they? They there was certainly there was certainly conquest and domination, but there was also a great deal of stability and 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 you know, and tradition that governed things, and it wasn't. Certainly well, within, things moved more slowly, didn't they? Things before the factory system and the industrial revolution. Thing, it took a long time for things to change in different places. Yes, and and a long time with this process, this kind of feedback through chance variation that we were talking about. The the, the feedback mechanisms weren't there. So um, when people in in Norfolk started using the the four field system, which had been imported from Holland, it may have been hugely successful. But it would probably be it might be 50 years of huge success we're using that system before it even spread to kind of you know suffolk and essex or something because we don't have the we did we don't have the there was the the um the means of recording things and the, the data that we that capitalism brings and the factory system brings and and, and you know the, the it and everything every everything speeds up because we can see what works much more quickly as as well as the fact that ideas get you know ideas get get you know copied and and everything else, but you can you you know what works more quickly once communication is better. And so well, this, it's, 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 the idea of what what, what works ahead, is man. is is not a purely e economic uh, notion in in society. I mean, what works in a society is what maintains social order and stability. Also, um, now you know the. Uh, you know that that's a, a a factor which Cohen simply doesn't. Well, he, doesn't he does say. Can I, he, can I, I want to ask Sean a question real quick. I want to. Did Marx, Sean? Did Marx have a theory of technological change apart from his critique of capitalism? Did he have a theory about how history changed um, that didn't rely on you know at, like his understanding of Adam Smith or his critique of Adam Smith or you know the the mm -hmm the political economy uh, aspect of, of yeah, I, yeah i think it's a historic i mean it's a it's it, you know it's it, it's a dialectical theory i mean which gives much more weight to the influence and the impact of the relations of production social relations uh, and indeed even of of of, of ideology religion for example than, sure, sure than, than, than I think Cohen allows. I mean, I'm not denying that Cohen, you know, he's not saying that there's no uh, reaction back on the base of the superstructure, but it's very, you know, it's an absolutely secondary thing because all the all the sort of uh, impetus in Cohen's account is, as I said earlier, from the bottom up. Technology changes, uh, you know, produ productive forces changes, um, relations of production changes, um, superstructure. I mean, that's the that's the form uh, that his account takes. So I'm hearing like a difference here because one of the problems that I think we're running into in this conversation is that Steve, you don't really want to uh, accept the definitions or the the critique of Cohen, um, but but because you think he covers the objections that he meets the objections that Sean's putting forward. Well, I, I, it's not but, so much but, but, but at the same time, there he is doesn't say what Sean's saying. He says, yeah, but but mm -hmm. yeah, right. Okay, that's right. You're, so yeah. he he meets the objections, and he isn't quite saying what Sean's saying. He's saying, but I think Sean is saying something you're not quite hearing too, and that okay, that it's easy to miss because you know this difference between an evolutionary understanding of human history and a dialectical one, I think, is key. And uh, so, like the question, I think, uh, would be, what do you see, maybe, Steve? as the difference between a Hegelian approach to history and this more analytical uh, approach based on evolution and, and science, and uh, that that might be in Cohen. Do you do you have a enough of a grip well, of the Hegelian approach to history? To I, I'm not a student of Hegel at all, so mm. um, but obviously you can't read Marx without you know having some you know reading around it and stuff. Um, Cohen, you, well, you tell that to Cohen. Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> tell, that, tell that to Cohen. I mean, if you could, well, I mean, you know, that's, his, that's his whole project. The first chapter he of Marx read Marx about Hegel. Hegel. Um, exactly. what, what Cohen yeah. says he's doing, and and I, I I'm I. No doubt Sean will disagree, and I'm not really in a position to um, argue the toss about that one. But what Co Cohen says he's doing is that he, he 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 says that his approach to Marx takes a 
um, takes the um, form of Hegel's argument and gives it new content. He says that's what Marx did. Marx took Hegel's form and gave new content, and and Cohen goes with that. So he doesn't completely. He doesn't deny. Or obviously, no one denies this. There's, there's an influence of Hegel in Marx. Um, I think different people have different ideas about how strong that influence is. Um, I think I think one mm. thing um, in those that, that it's important to kind of um, to be aware of, and I don't, I don't know if she, I, I, I think Sean probably will agree with this, but I, I don't know. So you tell me if not. Um, is that you know Marx wrote over decades. Uh, he was an economist, a philosopher, a historian, a journalist, a political agitator. He, his life saw huge changes in what was going on in the world and various things, thing, events coming and going. Um, there is no, you, you know, it would be foolish to try and find a definitive Marx. There is no, you could, you know, the idea that there's one interpretation and everyone else is wrong. I think is. No, just, I absolutely, I do agree with that, and I, I, I think I agree. With that, that, I mean. mean it's viable it's valid in fact we've got no choice but to take from marx what we think is valuable to us what's the point of this you know on the one point there's a historical interest in studying marx like there would be about aristotle or emily bronte or whatever but there's also you know people tend to look at marx because they can see there's something wrong with the world and they want to understand what that is and how to change it and when we look at marx we see different things there that we can gain from 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 well, that Marx can help us to understand the world with, and if if I see one set of things and Cohen sees another and Sean sees another and Doug you see another, that's not that's, there's no problem with that. That's that's okay. No, but at the same you know, time, okay. I, mean, okay. I, yeah, I want time. to argue that you know that uh, of course um, uh, Cohen doesn't deny that Hegel has an influence on Marx. But what he's trying to do, the whole point of his uh, interpret way of interpreting. Uh, Marx is to try and interpret Marx without any reference to Hegel, to write right. Hegel out of the picture. Can, now, so, that so is, Sean, why does Cohen want to practice. do that? Why does Cohen want to be, be, interpret for, Marx for, for, Hegel? for philosophical reasons? I mean, he's an you know he's coming from a, a, a philosophical position, analytical philosophy, which is very strongly analytical and which denies the you know the essentiality of of the you know of, of seeing things in uh, in development and change and seeing things. But his whole book uh, is about change. Uh, 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 yeah, but, but <laughs> what is it that's I mean, changing? That, but it's, it's his philosophical commitments that, mm. that you know, but, that, and but, that, I mean, it isn't just Cohen. I mean, you know, the, in, over the last 50 years, over the time I've been, a, you know, since I was a student, um, there's been a tremendous hostility to Hegel in Marxist interpretation, not only from Cohen, not only from analytical philosophy, but from... Althusserian and structuralist uh, writers. Sean, well. I, I don't think people okay, wait, 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 hold on, Steve, to attack Steve, Hegel now. How's the best way to do it? Steve, I, I want to. My goal, my goal, my goal here is to try to. I'm always keeping the the people who are watching in mind, and I want to like uh, uh, try to clarify what the disagreement is. That's my goal right now, and I think that there's two different disagreements. One is, is Sean being fair to Cohen? And let's just agree that he's not. All right. Like, like he's just totally wrong about Cohen. All right. So we'll agree about that. But there's this other disagreement, which is uh, what is the nature of human society? How does history work? Um, yeah. And, and how, how natural is, is human development or, and how, or how historical is it? Um, and so, I think, I think Sean's right in the, in as much as Cohen was trying to get away from Hegel, and I think you'd agree that he was to a degree, right, Steve? So the question um, is like, no, well, I, I'd agree that he did get away with he from, from Hegel. I wouldn't say that that was his his aim. I'd say okay, that, that is that just okay, happened. right? Okay, but but in any case, um, not trying to you know to smear Cohen here, but just to say uh, if there is a distinction between analytic. Uh, Marxism and Hegelian Marxism, I think it has to do with, I'm going to say, the role that human subjectivity has in history rather than uh, the role that the natural forces um, and an innate sort of instinctual drive to survive has. Um, would Sean, do you think that's correct? That I think it's correct, but it's but there's more than that one can say. It's not just subjectivity, it's 
social relations, its traditions and customs in society. It's all sorts of social uh, factors as well as, I agree, as well as subjective, you know, religion and political consciousness and so forth. It's, you know, all those factors play a role. They're not, they're not the primary role. Cohen's quite right about that in Marx. Marx believes that the primary role is taken by material forces, but they have a, you know, they have a very important, uh, in, you know, secondary role, if you like, determine, I mean, and sometimes um, uh, they have an autonomous role, uh, which is, um, Cohen, I think, just does not, um, does not recognize. And I thought that would, his is a deterministic theory. It's, okay. it's, you know, it's, you know, it's deter. It, it's the it's technology and the development of technology that you know that has a if you like a sort of one way, uh, predominantly one way influence on the whole development. And I Steve, think that, Steve, I, I want I, I want to ask you a question, Steve, to direct this. Okay, could I just come yeah, back yeah. on that? Could I just jump yeah. in with a quote? I'm going to read you a quote. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've enlarged it. I don't even need to put my glasses on. Um, so the quote is. Definite material conditions of production impose definite social forms. Impose, that is. Definite material conditions of production impose definite social forms. And it is through the development of material conditions that social relations change. Okay, so that's a quote. And that sounds to me pretty deterministic. That's what I would yeah. call material deterministic, uh, technological yeah. determinism. But that's a quote from the article Sean sent me that he wrote criticizing Cohen for being too deterministic. Sorry, that was my that was me saying that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, no, that's probably true. I mean, I probably did say that. I, I mean, it was a long time ago, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed my view on that. I mean, that's the prime that's the primacy side of things. You know, so, um, but there's nowhere in there that you say, oh, but and things feed back. But but Cohen spends about 60% of the book that we're talking about, talking about how how these feedback mechanisms work and how the how the forces and relations of production interact with, with each other and how I think, it is, I mean, I think the person enables new production relations which in turn affect the, the, the technological development that is possible. But there I, do, I would disagree with you. I don't think he does emphasise that. And I think that um, the person, I think, you know, I mean, what... Uh, you know, one, the, the, uh, uh, sorry, I've, uh, I've lost no, you know that. what I want to, I want to, I want to, um, just want you, just can I give Steve, time. can I get Steve, okay. I want to ask you a question All right, and I'm on. Steve, I'm going to set you up to go after Sean on in, in a new way. It won't just be about Cohen anymore. It'll be about his interpretation of Marx. Okay. So here's my question for you, Steve. I don't have you, a problem with Sean's interpretation. Of Marx. Uh, well, you should maybe uh, here. I'm giving you something you can <laughs> use. Okay. So earlier, Sean, you said that Marx doesn't have a, a moral accounting of capitalism, that he didn't have, that he wasn't an egalitarian quite the way that Cohen wants yeah, to describe that, him. Yeah, that's... And, and, and that socialism wouldn't necessarily be, shouldn't be conceived as a more just society. Not, and, and, not only as that. I mean, not, right. that, not primarily as that. So the question I want to ask Steve is, do you disagree with that do you think that Marx maybe did have more of a theory of justice and morality and also that he was more of an egalitarian that uh, okay. than a Hegelian Marxist might want to yeah. say? I, I yes, I think I think so. But but it's also it's not a hill I'm gonna die on because ultimately I don't care. Um, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, I I have a I have a a, a, um, a kind of a moral objection to capitalism. And mm. um if if Marx didn't, but I can still take something from Marx, which will help me understand what capitalism capitalism is and how we're going to get through it. Great, that's fine. But if, but actually, I think if you if you um, if the argument is that Marx didn't see capitalism as unjust, but just saw it as a system which he was kind of scientifically describing and 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 saying that we're going to move on to the next one as we have done from feudalism to capitalism, etc. I think that there's that really famous quote from Marx about, you know, the, the point is to change the world. Um, mm. The philosophers mm -hmm. have, up, here to, here, up to here, the philosophers have described the world, but the point is to change it. Why? 
if it's not more just, why? Yeah, and Sean, wouldn't you say that there's many places in capital, his most, you know, his most um, uh, historical, political, you know, critique, of, his most dispassionate. It's not his journalism. This is his theory. There's many places in capital oh, yeah, one absolutely. where he's it's outraged. Yeah, outra outraged, bitterly critical. You know, um, of course that's true, and of course, I mean, I'm sorry. I perhaps I should have, I, perhaps I expressed myself too. Uh, simplistically, of course, there's a moral dimension uh, to Marxism, and of course, there's a moral dimension to his um, advocating uh, a, a different a socialist form of society, which will be a fairer and a juster form of society. Of course, that's the case, mm -hmm. but that's not the you know that's not the pri I don't think that's the primary basis of his account of capitalism or his critique of capitalism, and I don't think that's the primary uh, basis of his. Uh, understanding of socialism. Socialism isn't just uh, a morally preferable society. It's a historically, I think Marx wants to say, a historically inevitable society, or inevitable is perhaps too strong a word, but it's the, it's a, it's the coming society, and that, you know, it's, the, it's going to be the result of historical forces uh, of the sort that partly yeah. Cohen does describe, rather than simply of moral preference. I think I think Marx was probably probably stronger on the inevitability of it. Yeah, than, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was involved in that <laughs> yeah. myself. I mean, he does say that sort of thing. I mean, he's you know he yeah. does say inevitable. Um, I'm not sure I'd go go along with him there, but uh, that's what he. Well, has. I think it's inevitable that something else will happen, isn't it? They, you know, part of the big point that that kind of fans of capitalism and and the kind of right wing critics of Marx. Miss, yeah. is that capitalism isn't the, the some kind of natural order where we, that we've settled down to forever it's just another stage on, on yeah the journey i think that's an incredibly important thesis in 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 marx you know that yeah. His, yeah. you know the idea of historical stages and capitalism just being a particular stage which came into being at a certain point has a certain life history to it and will be superseded i think that's hugely important yeah Yes, I agree. Um, so I, I have one other question I want to ask. We have some time left, but I just want to ask this of both of you. How important, uh, again, I can, I'm coming back to something you've already mentioned, but the, the theory of value that's, that Marx put forward, mm -hmm. puts forward in Capital um, and the way that he explains you know, money and, and all these uh, uh, seemingly like everyday phenomena, the commodity um, uh, and, and the logic behind them, how important is value theory to Cohen and how important do you think it is to Marx? And Steve, I'll ask you first and then Sean, you can take um, I think um, it's it's not that important to Cohen. He's he's not really concerned that much with Marx's, the, you know, the details of Marx's economic analysis of capitalism. He's much more concerned with the kind of broad brush of, um, of history and, and the Kind of more macro analysis of of capitalism as a system of who owns what and what ownership means and what kind of things can be owned um, and that kind of thing and contrasting it to feudalism mainly but of various pre-capitalist uh, formations and um i and i think that's probably because partly because he's not an economist so he doesn't have the the, the training to 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 kind of go in and, and pick that apart and, and also i don't think he has the interest to go in and pick that apart he's he wrote um a pretty good paper on the labor theory of value or marxist um, labor theory of value um which is available it's on the internet it's free it's on i think it's on verso books website if you just google cohen ga cohen marxist uh, or labor theory of value then you'll get that and i think for me that's a, that's um that's I don't I don't actually agree with Cohen on that one, but I do find the the way he approaches it is a, a way that I is something is a way I like because it's it, what don't it, you agree with him about? What did he say um, that you disagree with? So he he comes out with a kind of a modified version, which is not that um all value is produced by labor, but that all things that have value are produced by labor, um, which is um it kind of as he says it kind of you know makes puts a big hole in really the point of it but he i think can't find a way of 
coming up with it, coming to any other conclusion. Um, there are, it's very difficult to talk about the labor theory of value, especially on, on a channel like this, because you know, you know, how it's all I ever want to talk about. It's like, that's all I ever want to talk about. <laughs> Doug, if you've got a thousand <laughs> listeners at this very second, you've got a thousand and three different interpretations of what the, what the labor theory of value means, what every one of its terms mean. What the all of them are wrong. Cause I have the right one. So, well, exactly. <laughs> so, so whatever anybody says, 999 of your audience are going to, and are going to, are going to think they are. Oh, he hasn't even got the basics down. Yeah, but yeah. you're conf- you're trying to keep the truth from people, Steve. It's very know, clear. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, uh, one thing I do agree with Karen on actually is that. Um, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know if this is something that Karen says. One thing I think about the labor theory of value is, um, I don't think. Well, it, it isn't. I would say I have argued and I will argue that it's not necessary. You don't need the labor theory of value to prove that there is exploitation in capitalism. And given that it's so contentious and everything else, what else does it do? I need I need it to have some other purpose than proving that exploitation happens under capitalism for me to invest the time required to get, a re- get really get to grips with it. Because if that's what it's for, then we can do that other ways. And if it doesn't have it, if you know, if I guess there are some other reasons for having a labor theory of value, but um, Sean, Sean what, what do you think about compelling at the moment? Sean, what do you think about Cohen's labor theory and his relationship to the labor theory of value? Well, I agree with Steve that it's not the central aspect of uh, of uh, Cohen's account of Marxism. Um, my imp- I mean, I can't remember this really well enough to 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 question what you've just said, Steve. But I mean, my impression, my memory is that 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 Cohen is very skeptical about uh, the labor theory of value and doesn't want to play it to play any sort of role in his account of 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 Marx's theory of history. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an economist either, and my, I, you know, the technicalities of it, that, 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 of it, I'm afraid, uh, pass me by. I just don't don't understand enough of the issues involved. I think one of the important roles that the labor theory of value plays in Marx, it, and this is a very general uh, sort of role, and I think why Marx would be, have been very unwilling to abandon it is that it ties labor with into you know into the notion of economic value the sort of absolutely central uh, feature of the way uh, our society works uh, it has that that role of you know it's not just a matter of convention value it's it's not just a matter of uh, you know the way we happen to want to uh, you know exchange things it's 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 absolutely fundamental work and value and labor and therefore, you know, the, the plays an absolutely fundamental role in the functioning of society. Uh, but that's a very general point. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know. And I mean, I don't understand the issues, the economic issues, well enough, really, to, to comment. And I, you know, I do agree that, you know, that's not my issue with Cohen. Yeah. Well, I I'm think that the labor theory of value, just I'm just going to, just, can I disagree with both of you now and say, yeah. I think the labor theory of value is, um, uh, important, the, the value theory in Marx is important and that it's very, that it emerges in a Hegelian way as you read Capital, that you can see him uh, using a Hegelian approach to understand economic categories as he as he writes Capital. Um, and, um, and I think that by understanding that this seemingly natural almost ontological force like that we see represented by money is historically produced and is a, a product of the, our social relations and the, the class system. Um, th- that is really helpful in for, I think would be very helpful for socialists as they try to overcome capitalism is to be able to have at least a, a fairly complicated understanding of of uh of marx's approach to value not like you know uh, absolute answer on every question but a a, 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 some nuanced perspective on it because um some questions get answered by understanding that that don't get answered otherwise like why aren't workers co-ops enough to create socialism you know why what does it mean to get rid of the working class um could state capitalism be something that existed? Uh, 
these questions you have to answer by referring to the economic categories. Okay, now I've done my lecture. I'll take my, uh, I'll step off the soapbox and I'll let Steve talk because he has a lot to say. So <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to remember what it was I was going to say now. Actually, yeah, I know. I keep doing that to you. Don't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it I told you that it wasn't going to be a fair fight. Like I'm, I, I'm like mm -hmm. a, a definitely biased referee, but we'll, I'll have you back on and we can discuss it again, Steve, because I do feel like um, I kind of beat you up a little bit here. Go ahead. Well, I, I think, um, yes, the, there's the labor theory of value, as is generally understood, and there's value theory in Marx. They're not, they're not the same thing. Obviously, you need an right. understanding of what value is and how it works. I think Marx sometimes goes around in circles a little bit with value. There's there's times where things where value is different under capitalism than in a, any other circumstance. And, and when you kind of follow it around to find out why, it turns out that it's different because it's under capitalism. Um, and there isn't, you know, it, it has this. What's wrong with that, Steve? I don't see the property problem. Property if it's if if it's value in in a capitalist society, and and the reason why it's esoteric is because it's in a capitalist society. So, um, I I think it can be a bit frustrating at times, especially for people who aren't um, economists. But I think I think the, the the concept of value in in Marx is a lot more than just the labor theory of value, and I think. Um, as I said, the problem with the labor theory of value is you, you need to get n absolutely nailed down exactly what you're talking about before you start. And it will only be one person or one, one faction's idea. And there's still another six dozen different interpretations of it that you need to deal with. And I'm not embarking on that unless I can, you know, look, unless I, it comes I, down, I, unless I, I would convince me it's absolutely crucial to do so. I come out of a sectarian uh, group, Marxist group. They had the right answer. I'm absolutely yeah. sure of it. It's a temporal single system interpretation of Marx. You guys just need to get with the program. Um, <laughs> as a good, uh, you know, neo trot, trot, this is my position, and I'm just going to put it down on the table. Sean, <laughs> what, what do you think about the conversation that we've had so far? Is it, do you think we've clarified the difference between Hegelian, a Hegelian approach to understanding? history and and capitalism enough or is there something that we should we've, add? we've begun it's 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 a very abstract issue i mean you know i mean you can do an awful lot with marx's theory and marx's understanding of society and politics without getting involved in these sort of deeper philosophical issues and whether they're dialectical or analytical is really at a very uh, far level of abstraction and for most purposes you know sort of, of everyday thinking about politics and history and society these these issues don't don't come up but occasionally they do come up and in cohen they're very very prominent and central cohen was first and foremost a, a philosopher he was a student of philosophy he worked in you know he worked in philosophy that was his that was his work and he raises these issues and they became very uh, central to the discussion that went on in the 70s and 80s and 90s between analytical Marxism, which was a whole movement, it wasn't just Cohen, uh, which tried to use these techniques of analytical philosophy uh, in Marxism. And I think that, and, and you know, they were very anti-Hegelian, and I think an awful lot of uh, what's important in, uh, in, in Marx's understanding of history and society is, is, is compromised, is, is lost, is, is, is blunted by that sort of approach. Uh, but they are very, you know, these are abstract philosophical issues. Uh, we've touched, we, I mean, I've, we've touched on them. Uh, there's a lot more to be said, I think. Yeah, well, Sean, I want to have you back too sometime and and uh, just so I can infuriate Steve. <laughs> <laughs> can I actually, can I, uh, so there was something I was just thinking about um, yeah. with, uh, so I think, you know, so Cohen's main thing is that he's very analytical. He takes everything apart. To, to, mm. goes into very detailed definitions of what things are and what they're not and but he then does put it back together and what sean's saying is he doesn't kind of put it back together enough or he doesn't put it back together in the right way but yes. i think my objection is to the idea that he doesn't put it back together because he certainly does and spends all his time much more time he spends much more time putting it back together and talking about how they relate yes all right i think that's correct i mean i think what he does is not put it back together in the right way he puts yes, it in, I think that's in a sort of deterministic that's uh, over, you sort of, disagree about you know bottom up way that's but i think fair. also as, as sean said this is kind of a highly in some ways it's a very abstract 
way. So if you think of if you think of something like a tin of beans, there's there's tins of beans, and and Cohen will take that tin of beans and say, weighs this much, and it's this high and this diameter, and the ingredients are such and such, and very tightly define it. But then he'll also have to say, but this is a tin of beans made in a capitalist country, so all the decisions about how big to make it and what ingredients should go in and whether it should be round or square or whatever, these have been influenced by the fact that it's purpose of its existence is to make somebody profit. And every decision is to make the most profit and, and to, to make the cheapest product sell for the most money. And so the, you can't separate that tin of beans from its social context because its social context has determined a lot of those things. Whereas a, a Soviet tin of beans or a tin of beans in some kind of future socialist utopia might be a different size and shape and weight and everything. And in the end, this conversation kind of boils down to Cohen saying, there are tins of beans and they will they will um, adopt different they will they will have different characteristics depending on whether they're in a capitalist society or, or a socialist society whereas sean i think would be saying no 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 there's there's capitalist beans and there's soviet beans <laughs> and they're not the same thing they're because they are because their society the context of their society is intrinsic to their nature it's not something that you can add on art you can't you can't define it as a tin of beans and then then go looking at the characteristics coming from a yeah, I think that's yeah. I mean, I think you know that that it's a made in a capitalist society will affect the way it's made, what's made, uh, you know, what's in that tin, the, the very tin itself, yeah. the advertising on the outside, and so forth and so on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, the, know, the, the, the word the tins of beans is about whether whether they're both the same thing or not. But actually, we both, you know, it's kind of yeah. it's kind of an abstract. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there weren't tins of beans in feudal society right there were, were there, beans. You? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that there weren't you, you know right yeah and so like there it's interesting to watch how the mode of production when it changes it also changes the oh. social forms of uh that that arise so like you know the different like why do we have popsicles like that's not something that would ever exist except under capitalism i think um and uh not, they're good i like them i don't i want to get rid of them i'm not anti-popsicle but it, that's definitely a product of capitalism you just wouldn't find it in uh of society based on subsistence farming you know so yeah <laughs> any final any any final comments um, well i think to some extent yes yeah, so, so popsicles are a product of somebody trying to make money and, and being able to make money out of that but they're also a product of kind of modern technology, which is a product of capitalism. It's not to say that there won't be pop popsicles in the post-capitalist utopia, is it? I hope there are. I don't, I don't want, if there aren't popsicles in com, under you capitalism, I'm, 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 I'm not part of your revolution. That's that's how I feel about it. Um, Sean, it, how do you think, there's any any last comments from you? And because we got an hour here, I feel like we got a good a good conversation it was fun anyhow i had fun yeah I don't know i've enjoyed it yeah, yeah i've enjoyed yeah. it i think it's um raised the, you know some some important issues all uh, right and steve how frustrated are you on a scale of one to ten right now? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's been it's been a good conversation i think okay. you know, we've, we've we've got to the bottom of a few things so. if you enjoyed this conversation please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>